Hello, uh, good morning in London, good evening in uh, Sydney and Points East, and welcome to LSE Ideas and to this second lecture in a series we've entitled Strategy New Voices. Uh, my name's Hugh Sandham and I'm a member of the LSE Ideas team. What we're trying to do in this series is to bring together leading experts from all around the world to tell us how states and policymakers are grappling with the issue of formulating and trying to practice strategies in the face of very, very complex situations in a, an extremely fast changing world. The first of the series we had in June when we asked the question uh, with uh, Professor Matt Koenig from the Atlantic Council of whether or not the US can actually these days formulate a coherent and credible national strategy mixed verdict, I have to say on that one. Uh, next time round in November, we'll look uh, with Professor Dmitry Suslov uh, of the Moscow Higher School of Economics at the issue of formulating and practicing Russian national strategy, that's on November the 11th. And going into next year, we'll tackle a number of issues, including urbanization in Africa, what strategies are being used to try and resolve that. Um, we'll look at strategies for national and international multilateral um, uh, approaches to climate change. Um, and we'll also look at uh, the strategic failure of open societies to develop a credible response to cyber offensives against them. Uh, the format today, um, Professor Christopher Coker, Director of LSE Ideas, is going to introduce Professor Go. Uh, and we'll put a number of questions to her after she's spoken. Then we'll have about 30 minutes um, of questions from the audience. You know the drill on that. Please put questions in the chat with your name. Uh, keep it short if you can. And we'll have plenty of time, I think, to take a number of questions from the audience. Uh, so Christopher, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh. Um, Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Christopher Coker, uh, Director of LSE Ideas, as Hugh has just said. I think we're meeting at an extremely timely uh, moment. Uh, great power competition is intensifying in East Asia, whether we see Russian or Chinese ships off Japanese islands, as we did a, a few days ago, or launch of Chinese hypersonic missiles. These trends are alarming. But in this context, there are also a number of very significant non-great powers that will play an important role in shaping uh, a new regional order uh, as China, uh, Chinese power increases and as that of the United States wanes. And to discuss this, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Evelyn Go, who is the Shedden Professor of Strategic uh, Policy Studies at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. Coral Bell is a very prominent international relations person, used to be in my old department at the London School of Economics. Um, she's also co-managing editor of Cambridge University Press Studies and International Relations, a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council in International Security, and there are many other things I could say. But to save time, let's cut to the chase, as they say in the United States. Uh, she's particularly interested, apart from just general matters of security studies, about traditional and non-traditional security issues and the role of non-great powers. So Evelyn, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Professor Koka, thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction. And um, thank you also to LSE Ideas uh, and Hugh Sandman for the invitation to speak in this lecture series. Um, this, this, will, this was great fun to prepare um, and I hope will be of interest and help to you as you um, uh, take forward this uh, lecture series on broadening out um, ideas and approaches to strategy. Um, as you've already said, uh, such a timely uh, lecture series um, in, in the current context and certainly issues that will continue to be of enormous importance in the decades in, ahead of us now. Um, what I'm going to spend the time I have um, uh, speaking about is the role of, well not the role, the strategies of non-great powers in East Asia um, in response to China's 
rise. Um, and this is at the request of um, the organizers of this lecture series. Um, just to help me to keep the time, I'm going to use a set of PowerPoint slides and for which I'm going to share my screen now. And I hope that you can see that well, just as you're able to continue to hear me. Is that okay? Can you see that? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, as I've indicated, um, the challenge, the strategic challenge that um, I'm going to focus on is China's resurgence. Um, and with, with that in mind, um, of course, you know, China's resurgence has, has global and international implications everywhere. Um, and at also different levels of analysis. Um, I am in the short time that I've got going to focus on the question of how East Asian states make and practice strategy in order to meet this challenge. Uh, so that's my, you know, a fairly sort of wide ranging remit in, in, in this lecture already. Um, on the right of this slide, you've got the sort of broad breakdown of uh, how I'm going to tackle this in four uh, parts in, uh, in this lecture. Um, the bulk of my remarks are going to center on the second part, which is about the strategies uh, that these non-great powers um, wield <clears throat> and try to put into practice specifically. But let me let me preface that um, by sort of, you know, dealing with some definitional issues and some scene setting issues. Um, then I'll talk about the strategies and then I'll briefly touch on some of the difficulties that I've, you know, that, that regional states have faced in trying to make these rather complicated and um, sophisticated strategies and, and to bring them to successful fruition. And then I'll, 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 I'll uh, end the lecture by, again, very briefly remarking on two aspects, um, uh, two implications that, that East Asian uh, non-great power strategies have for strategy more broadly, you know, stra you know strategy for the, for the current uh, context more broadly. So it's a four-parter and let, let, let me start um, with the first question of, of just getting definitions out of the way. Um, I'm going to focus on what I've called East Asia. I do realize that um, ways of signifying different parts of Asia uh, can, can be confusing. So just to be absolutely clear about this, by East Asia, I mean the combination of the 10 uh, states in Southeast Asia, which collectively may, uh, make up the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, along with what is thought of in the region as the plus three in Northeast Asia, so China, South Korea, and Japan. Now, as this is about a response to China's resurgence, I'm obviously not going to talk about China. So I'm really going to be focusing on Southeast Asia, South Korea, and Japan. Um, now, oh, let me go back. I've preceded myself. Yes, okay. Um, first thing to say, contextually about this East Asian region, when we think about all, all the sort of entities apart from China, um, is that this is a collection of most unusual states uh, for very many different reasons. But from the strategist's point of view, uh, it, it's a collection of unusual states. If we look at Japan, first of all, of course, you know, until 2010, the second largest economic power, it's that second largest economy in the world, after 2010, the third largest economy in the world, um, undoubtedly uh, economically powerful, but in broader strategic terms, still an abnormal power, militarily emasculated by the post-war constitution. Um, and, you know, since around the 1970s, particularly, you know, having risen as a sig significant international player on the basis of being a trading state. Right, so that rather sort of lopsided kind of power base uh, to Japan. Um, then we have South Korea, um, or Korea, if we want to think about it that way. Korea as a whole, the longest lasting stable polity in the region, right? Which over a thousand years, has, has an over a thousand years existence in approximately its present boundaries since the Korea dynasty, right? Today, a pop cultural superpower, uh, but since decolonization at the end of the Second World War, Korea has been a divided country and a separated people, right? Um, currently reliant on a variety of other 
uh, great powers as well as regional players to help stabilize and hopefully eventually resolve uh, this state of division in that nation. If we move further south, we've got Southeast Asian countries, which in some ways are quite similar to Korea. Um, you know, there is a Korean proverb that when whales fight, uh, the shrimp's back is broken. And the Southeast Asian corollary to that proverb is that when the elephants fight or when they make love, the grass gets trampled, all right? Um, that commonality there being that post-colonial, um, uh, more subordinate kind of, you know, uh, history uh, to both Southeast Asia and, the, and Korea as well. Southeast Asia has, has a few other peculiarities. Um, which are worth pointing out as, as a sort of scene setting exercise. Um, it is not only post-colonial and in, 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 in many ways consists of many transitional states. Um, it is also geographically a thoroughfare. Uh, this is an issue which, which I, I always emphasize when talking about uh, this sub-region. Um, it is you know, conceived of as, as the region you know, that one has to traverse to connect China and India. And that's been the case where the one thinks about trade um, or the spread of religion and so on and so forth in, in the long history of, of this region. Um, it is a region which has no history of dealing only with a singular um, hegemonic power or great power, internal or external. Indeed, quite the opposite. It is a region with a complex history of having multiple layered tributary and other sorts of subordinate relationships. Um, I've borrowed this remarkable diagram from my colleague Robert Cribb at the ANU, um, you know, which I think beautifully illustrates uh, this point. This is cast circa 1800 as, you know, one gets the um, uh, consolidation of Western uh, imperial powers into the region, but it shows you the pre-existing uh, complicated uh, tributary uh, and other kinds of subordinate relations that sort of mark um, mainland and maritime Southeast Asia as well, gives you a sense of that um, complicated uh, sets of um, superordinate and subordinate relationships. That, that's the kind of history that that Southeast Asia comes from. So, you know, again, the colonial experience um, in Southeast Asia too, you know, was never one in which there was a single colonial power with, you know, all encompassing interests across what is a very diverse region. Um, so it's a region that, you know, it's, 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 it's a thoroughfare subject to multiple great power pressures um, and parts of the region also um, have what I call a sandwich situation of being hemmed in you know, on either side by competing uh, regional great powers. Um, Burma, of course, being um, a, the, the classic example in, in this part um, of Southeast Asia. So that's, that's the kind of context of the East Asia that I'm talking about and, and the non-great powers of, of this region. That, that's, I mean, you're beginning to get a sense already that, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it, it's a context that varies um, significantly within the region, but it's also a context that is at significant variance from the types of assumptions that we tend to hold when we think in the traditional mainstream mode of strategies and what we would expect, you know, um, uh, non-great power states to be, to be thinking in terms of options when it comes to dealing with multiple great powers. So let me, let me move on to the second part of, of of the talk, uh, which is on the strategies um, that we may observe in East Asia's non-great powers, uh, roughly in the contemporary period. I mean, there's a fascinating story in the historical context, but we're not going to go there today. We think about the contemporary period. Now, I'm going to split this part um, roughly into three, and I'm going to start by casting um, East Asian strategies to deal with China's resurgence in the broader mold, right? Um, and of what I'm calling great power management 
by non-great powers. Okay, so in the international relations literature, particularly when we talk about great power management, this is indelibly associated with Hedley Ball's idea of great power management, but that focuses on great powers managing their relationships with each other. There's of course the other side of this, which is how non-great powers try to manage great powers. And that's what I mean when I say great power management, right? And I'd just like to remind us that East Asian states approaches to trying to deal with China's contemporary resurgence is cast in this broader holistic um, strategic enterprise of trying to manage multiple great powers in the region. It's not just about trying to manage China, right? Um, and I think that, that's, that's quite an important one um, uh, to, to bear in mind. And this will become obvious as I go along in this section of the talk. Now, the other thing to note, of course, once we think about these great power management strategies um, is that East Asian states, you know, have a tendency anyway Right, and this is well covered in the existing literature of not fitting into the expectations or established categories, largely Western categories, or an assumptions of how non-great powers should be responding to a changing power distribution amongst uh, great powers uh, in their surroundings. Um, and and the, the entry point to this that, that we all know best, right, is, is that sort of pair of binary options uh, that for a long time persisted in the literature to try to capture, you know, what the two options were for if you were a non-great power state faced with a um, apparent uh, significant change in the distribution of power such as that caused by China's uh, rising in a system that was uh, previously dominated by the US as incumbent hegemon. And the binary options are you can balance right, uh, which is essentially activities that allow you to try to counter, counter way or to offset the dangers that are posed by the rising power, trying to shift the status quo, you know, away from one that favors that rising threatening power that's balancing. Um, the other side of that binary, you could choose the bandwagon, throw in your lot, right, um, with the stronger or more threatening power in the hopes of um, uh, overcoming the threat or in the hopes of gaining profit from doing so. So that, that's, that, you know, for a long time sort of dominated the, 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 the range of options that were theoretically available, uh, conceptually anyway, um, uh, to non-great power states in that kind of situation. Now, as, as, again, as we all know, because it's well covered in the existing literature, <laughs> there is obviously a large range of other things that states can do, have done, both you know, in the European context historically, but also in the Asian context, uh, contemporarily and historically, um, apart from balancing and bandwagoning, right? So it's a big range here, um, but, but you know, of other options, but that have not been dealt with in as much detail as the expectations that one ought to see balancing or bandwagoning. Now, in, in the East Asian context, the, the lens that has become fairly uh, prevalent and quite useful as a shorthand for trying to describe what it is that East Asian states have been doing in response to China's rise, um, that because what they've been doing do not fit uh, neatly either into the balancing or the bandwagoning category is the term hedging. Now, this is again one that many in the audience will be familiar with. Um, and, and on this slide, I've just put up um, obviously a very self-interested um, definition uh, of it. You know, the key being that notion of trying to forestall or having, trying to avoid having to choose one side or to take a very straightforward policy stance in favor of one side at the obvious expense of the other. Okay, so the economic analogy of, of hedging your bets and, and placing bets in, in both, you know, both towards, um, in an upwards and downwards fashion. Um, this, of course, you know, can be fleshed out in a variety of different ways. Um, but let me just give you an illustration of what I mean by this being a category of strategic concepts and activity that don't fit in either the balancing or the bandwagoning uh, category of expectations. 
right um in in what uh, there is a long and you know detailed uh, expose on this um in, in a full length article but let, let me just summarize right if we think about southeast asian varieties of hedging for example uh, one finds within that range of strategic approaches three things which are not normally put in the same category and very often in the literature expected to be contradictory to each other, right? We have on the one hand, that obvious thing about deterrence, right? When you're balancing, yes, one of the things you're trying to do is to build up your forces individually or collectively to try and deter aggressive actions from the rising power, right? So there is the deterrence function, but in Southeast Asia, the deterrence function is not, is not performed by Southeast Asian states themselves. It's performed indirectly by trying to facilitate continued US forward projection in the region so that US forces can deter China, okay? So there's indirect. But secondly, there is that element of triangular politics as well, trying to use bilateral relations with the US on the one hand, Right, as leverage to improve bilateral relations with China, on the other hand, and vice versa. Right, so this is what I mean by responding to China's rise is not about China alone. When you're a non-great power, it cannot be. It's got to involve other great powers. Um, and then find the final section of the Southeast Asian kind of hedging, you know, um, entails enmeshment. All right, it, it's got a socialization function as well. It's got a social function of trying to integrate as many interested great powers into the regional order as possible so that they can you know, politically balance each other. Again, this is a very potted summary of what is a rather sort of complicated phenomenon, but this is simply to illustrate um, how these activities and, and, and strategic approaches don't fall into those neat categories. Incidentally, when I published this article in 2008, the main response I got was not from Southeast Asia, which obviously recognized all this because they do it. But the main response I got was in Northeast Asia, right? I had Korean scholars and, and, and practitioners and Japanese scholars and practitioners coming to me to say, hey, you know, your article is great. It describes Southeast Asia, but it also describes us, right? Um, and that was what set me on to thinking harder about, you know, what were some of the similarities that, that connected the Southeast Asian, you know, small and medium-sized um, states, and the, these two Northeast Asian key players, right? Okay, two other things I want to highlight in terms of strategies in um, uh, East Asia's uh, non-great powers. First, this broader focus. I've already thought, I've already mentioned that we've got to think more holistically when we think about great power management in this region. When we look in detail at some of these states' uh, strategies for great power management becomes obvious that one of the things that, that, that they have in common is this broader focus on what they sometimes call regional order or regional stability, as opposed to a sort of individual emphasis on power accumulation uh, or power distribution or war fighting, right? That, that broader focus on regional order, regional stability is always there and quite often uh, somewhere near the forefront of their strategic thinking. I'll give you a couple of examples. Th this can be a little bit difficult um, when, when, when you look at the policy rhetoric or when you try to digest um, some of the academic analyses that come you know, um, specifically out of the region from a sort of regional focus. I'll give you an example from Japan and an example from Korea. So there's been a spate of, to me, rather exciting work um, in recent years um, from scholars who specialize um, in the, the, the strategic um, approaches of, of particular East Asian countries, um, all in the English language, all very accessible for, for scholars who may not have lang linguistic ability to look at the original material uh, in, 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 in the region. Um, I'll give you an example from Tamaki's um, piece uh, uh, in, uh, published last year in, in a collection of articles that try to, to think about how key US allied partners in the region and in Europe are rethinking the US alliance uh, 
um, and also the role of the US alliances in their national security strategies. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've block quoted uh, Tamaki's explanation on, on the right hand side of this slide. And, and the key point here is the claim he makes that in the current context, you know, as we would expect, the US alliance is absolutely crucial to Japan. But it's always been a pillar, always been the pillar for Japanese strategy. But today, right, it is only one, right, of the most important uh, policy tools for helping Japan to realize a rules-based order. Now, I'm going to, uh, the, the bit on the right on this slide just very quickly summarizes that claim and what the other two most important policy tools are that Tamaki claims, you know, are important for Japan. So yes, it is the alliance, right? Um, but at the same time, and this part is important, at the same time, he argues, you know, Japan has pursued internal balancing, right? Um, a strategy of building up the Japanese defense forces, of orientating the Japanese defense forces in a significant way, you know, towards the maritime uh, concerns uh, from China, but at the same time, a renewed emphasis on trying to build what he calls diplomatic consensus, right, with other partners, including authoritarian states and including China, as a way to build a foundation, right, for the rules-based order that Japan wants to bolster in the region. It's a it's, it's, a, it's a complex article, a uh, very subtle one, but I think it's a nice sort of illustration of what I mean by this broader order emphasis. Here's another one from a South Korean perspective. Uh, this is from Ji Yong Lee's um, uh, contribution in uh, the 2020 uh, um, National Bureau of Asia Research um, Annual uh, Collection. And she's thinking about, again, the same theme, right? The role of the US alliance in uh, South Korean strategic uh, considerations in the contemporary context, particularly in the context of the recent experience of the Trump administration. And she makes, I think, quite clearly the point, right? Uh, up front to remind us of how the really important thing about the Korean context, which again, the the, the um, italicized bit here on the left-hand side of this slide, the kind of threat that, no, that South Koreans feel from China are not military in nature, they're political in nature, right? She reminds us. Um, and that's really important for how we then understand how South Korea treats the US alliance, right? Not in the sense of a sort of countervailing coalition against rising China, but rather, as she puts it, you know, best understood as a mechanism to help enhance South Korea's a political leverage to deal with China, right? Subtle difference there, but not the kind of military containment function of an alliance within that South Korean strategic mindset. She also looks, and I think this is quite important, when we think about the Korean context, which is rather singular because of that divided nature. She also argues that, yes, some people think about the, the ROK alliance with the United States primarily as focused upon defending against North Korean uh, aggression. That is true. Um, and she makes the point that, um, that that issue of defending against North Korean aggression doesn't stand on its own, but is embedded in the broader role that the US alliance is perceived you know, to play in helping to create ultimately stability on the Korean Peninsula, right? Um, so, you know, again, no need division between peace in the peninsula and peace in the region, right? No need division between Korean national security and regional order. The two things, right, go hand in hand, right? Um, there's obviously a lot to say about this if one thinks about the South East Asian context where the word order um, does appear with remarkable consistency um, in, in the articulation of strategies in, in this sub-region. Um, I'd only quickly, very quickly illustrate uh, 
um, using again some work that 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 I've done in my 2013 book, where you know I do the analysis to remind my readers that a lot of what Southeast Asian countries were trying to do in the two and a half, yeah, about two and a half decades after the end of the Cold War was to try and bring about a regional order that would, number one, retain the United States as preponderant hegemon in the region, East Asian region. But number two, equally importantly, to integrate China into this regional order, right? In a way that would see China grow rich and, and prosper and be stable, but also, you know, uh, be constrained, right? Um, by regional institutions and by US hegemony. And so, you know, again, that broader sense of what kind of regional order, right, would secure national interests for individual states, rather than starting from the point of view of how do we do strategy in a way that maximizes our security individually separate from the broader regional order. That's the point I'm trying to get at, that, you know, there's a broader notion there. The second really marked thing that comes across, right, whenever we think about East Asian strategies is what I'm going to call the economic security nexus. There's no way to run away from this. And one of the things I say to all my PhD students or people who want to do PhDs with me and want to work on East Asia is you need to get your head around the economics, right? Uh, you, you can't, you just can't study uh, Asian security today uh, only with a fixation on military security, um, you know, as its own terrain, right? Um, and part of the reason for saying that uh, is, is because of the way security is conceived um, in the region itself, uh, both for historical, for ge you know, geographical, um, and for political reasons, right? Um, when, we, when, we mention, when I talk about economic security nexus, I mean that very tight interconnection that one finds when you scrape, but not too far from the surface of any East Asian country, you see a very tight confluence of, you know, the idea that one has to have economic prosperity secured in a, you know, in an ongoing way, you know, and that's very much tied to notions of how a nation secures itself, um, uh, guarantees its sovereignty and autonomy, um, how that would in turn help you know, ruling elites to satisfy, you know, opposing domestic constituencies, how that would help ensure uh, performance legitimacy and ultimately regime security going forward. You know, you don't have to scrape very far below the surface in any East Asian uh, states sort of, you know, political, economic ideology or ideas to get to this nexus. Um, and you know, those of you with some familiarity with concepts of security in the region will know what I mean because this has actually, you know, been encapsulated um, fairly consistently in, in, you know, various individual national articulations of, of security, but also in collective articulations of security, such as in the ASEAN Concord. I've placed some examples here, but essentially that notion of security being comprehensive, right? to en en encompass not just military security, not just sort of national uh, traditional security, but also very quickly notions of economic security and political security articulated in a variety of ways, as I've very quickly highlighted on this slide. There is another reason for not being able to distinguish easily the economic and the security elements of strategy in the region. And this has to do with the economic foundations of hegemony, right? Um, and this, I think I've always liked uh, this episode from 2015, uh, which at the time when it got reported in the press, sounded like, you know, there was a small upstart in Southeast Asia trying to sort of, you know, teach um, the American grannies how to suck eggs. All right. This was the episode in, in, in June 2015 uh, when, when the Southeast Asians in, in, in the form of the then Singapore foreign minister made a last ditch effort to try to persuade the Obama administration that they absolutely had to push through the Trans-Pacific Partnership Economic Agreement. Um, and 
I think the logic here is very, very well encapsulated. He told John Kerry, Secretary of State at the time, you must get this done because if you don't do this, your only lever of power left in the region is the Seventh Fleet, your military strength. And that's really not the lever that you want to use, right? And trade is strategy, uh, was that very blunt reminder, right? Um, and this at the time got tied up with, you know, rather um, blunt reminders about U.S. credibility, not just being tied to its economic and not just being tied to its military projection in the region, but through its economic commitments in the region as well. Now, there's a bigger story here, of course, right? Underlying that is not just some belief that, you know, you know, one that one's got to look for economic profit um, as well as uh, military security. Underlying that is the structural condition uh, that, you know, U.S. hegemony was, you know, at, at base founded on an economic grand bargain, right? Um, that, that bargain between the U.S. and its supporter states all around the world, and most latterly, including China, right? Um, that exchange market access, you know, for exports from the rest of the world, that exchange basically, you know, um, uh, su supporter states buy large amounts of U.S. debt in order to, <laughs> you know, facilitate huge, massive state spending on the part of the United States, including on things like the Seventh Fleet, that exchange of surplus for deficit. This is the thing that's been unraveling, right, in recent years, which is what reminds us <laughs> that at the, at, you know, at base, you know, in the hegemonic system is an economic bargain. For these reasons, right, um, we're, we're in this conundrum, right? China rose within this bargain and remains dependent upon this economic order, which has uh, accompanied US hegemony. The problem today, because this bargain is unraveling, right, is what leads to concerns in the region about decoupling, about how to balance the economic dependencies, uh, both on China and the United States, with the changing security situation. Now, just very quickly in the two minutes that I'm going to take uh, uh, left, let me mention some of the difficulties that have attended this sophisticated approach to strategy. It's obviously not an easy thing to do um, and comes with, you know, as you might expect, a series of risks and perils. And obviously we're not in a situation at the moment to be able to make the call very clearly about whether these strategies are successful or not. It's, we'll have to see, it's ongoing. Two difficulties in particular. One is that condition of complex interdependence, which I've already begun to allude to, right? Um, you know, what we've moved from, right, is that, you know, convenient situation in which you had the source of economic hegemony being the same as the source of military hegemony, right? This is particularly the post-Cold War period that interregnum when we had the US as regional hegemon, right? Um, same source that provided economic and security or military order, okay? Now that China has risen, right? We have two great powers with concentrations of economic and security power. Right. Both are comprehensive powers. Okay. You know, the arguments that the US is a security hegemon while China is the economic hegemon is, I feel, misleading. Right. And, and both are economic and security powers. So, so that, that's the problem. Or, you know, that, that's, what cre that's what creates that complex interdependence when you are a non great power state in East Asia trying to think, how do I choose between them? Right. Um, Second problem you've got in terms of difficulties is contestation, right? There's a much more intense disagreement now within the region as different states adjust and find new parameters of their hedging, right? Given their particular national imperatives, okay? So we all know about Cambodia's split from the rest of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in 2012, for example, over the South China Sea issues. Uh, we've all read about different responses within Southeast Asia to the Philippines case in the Permanent Court of Arbitration. 
uh, versus China, again on the South China Sea issues. Um, we hear a lot about continued differences between the ROK and Japan in how to respond to China, US-China tensions, um, or how to respond to new developments like AUKUS, all right? Um, we also get increased contestation within countries, all right? Um, as interest groups within their domestic context tussle over the evolving new distribution of benefits and risks associated with the changing nature of the economic and security orders, okay? Um, so that rising uh, phenomenon of contestation uh, is a very marked one. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to skip that illustration and just bring us to the close here. Um, now, there, this topic obviously has required that we push the boundaries of strategy as traditionally conceived, right? Um, there are two key questions that arise from this very quick um, discussion I've given you about East Asian non-great powers um, for strategic studies and strategies more broadly, right, who may focus on other parts of the world. First issue, you know, is that China's ascendance, right, is a multidimensional and a full spectrum phenomenon, right, especially in East Asia. So from, from the point of view of regional states, a purely military power focused strategy has never been on the table, right? Instead, we find more innovative concepts and practices of strategizing and of making strategic policy. There is an argument that states beyond the ones I've talked about this in this lecture are increasingly facing the multidimensionality of China's rise. So I think there are some uh, points here that are more broadly relevant uh, outside of the East Asian region. Finally, you know, are there some inherent challenges to strategizing today, regardless of whether you're in East Asia or in other parts of the world? And I think the cases of non great powers in East Asia are, in, are quite important examples of how this inherent difficulty is indeed inherent and actually quite a common situation. Um, note that, of course, the countries that I've described in East Asia are of a large variety, right? They're not of a type. In fact, they're pretty atypical. But there's an argument for saying that all countries in the world today face a common condition which is marked by complex interdependence, by depluralization and contestation in the international system, and by having to deal with the transition out of a post-US hegemonic, post-Cold War order, right? If you buy that, uh, then there are things in, in these East Asian cases that will be potentially helpful for everyone else dealing with this common condition. Okay, I will stop there with apologies for having gone over my time somewhat. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Evelyn, for a very intellectually rich uh, discussion. Um, there's a lot uh, that I would like to um, take you up on in the 15 or 20 minutes I'm allowed before we open it up to the Q&A. And I'm very pleased that um, you have you've addressed the question, which is the whole point of the global strategies uh, exercise that we're conducting at Ideas is how you strategize uh, in a very, very complex world. You talked about in complex interdependence and contestation, both within countries and between countries, and particularly how you strategize at historical turning points. And I think we're at a historical turning point, as you expressed in East Asia, indeed in much of the world. The, Middle East, the same would be true, I think, of the Middle East when you have a hegemonic power that is either in decline or at least its hegemonic moment has perhaps passed, um, either because, as you said, in the case of East Asia, the economic grand bargain uh, is no longer being honored uh, and you have political gridlock in Washington that makes it very difficult for the US to deliver on, on anything. So let me, let me start uh, with a foundational question. Um, how, how do you define a non-great power and, and why do you avoid using terms like middle power or even regional power. And was Japan uh, ever a great power? You know, from what was interesting about your discussion is that Japan was obviously an economic great power in the Cold War, 
but it was a it was a pygmy a dwarf uh, as the term was often used in washington when it came to political clout uh, and certainly uh, military clout which would suggest the economy is not enough um, but that is that because of the cold war context and in the post cold war context now the economy is is everything and that's my first foundational question Would you like me to deal with that? Yes, please. First? Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to do. It. Yeah, simple answer to that. We we had a bit of an exchange about this, and and you know, mm. calling it non-great powers is, is a deliberate deliberate choice um, mm. because of the need to deal with the range of uh, countries that that I've tried to reflect here, uh, both in Southeast Asia and you know, taking into account Korea and Japan. Um, you know, pe people who can, have made different judgments on this, including myself, um, within Southeast Asian context, you know, it doesn't make sense to call them all small states. Um, it also doesn't make sense to call, you know, you get into fights if you say that Indonesia is a middle power, but not, you know, Malaysia, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but for the purposes of this exercise, my main reason was that non-great powers is the category that captures, right? <laughs> the full range of the countries that I wanted to, to, um, to think about in this lecture. Um, just to answer your question about Japan and its, its, its great powerdom or not, um, in, in, a, in, in a recent book um, that I published with Barry Buzan last year, um, we, we looked at the US, uh, we looked at China and Japan, and I explicitly addressed Japan as a great power, right, in that. But we're looking at a sort of long historical context. Um, so yes, it is possible, of course, to think about Japan as a great power if one admits and thinks about that economic um, basis of its power as sufficient, right, to, to allow it to be a system, a systemic player. Um, you know, in the context of the lecture today, um, I, I chose to remain a bit fuzzy on that uh, because what I wanted to highlight is the asymmetry of Japan's port for power portfolio if you like, right, that issue. I mean, and this is how strategists will look at it, I think, you know, in an intuitive way. Um, if, if, you, if you didn't have, or if you were so constrained as Japan is on the military front, on the ability, you know, not just to have full-fledged, you know, um, uh, offensive military capability, but not actually to be able to deploy that in an autonomous uh, fashion because of the constitutional constraints, then there's going to be a question about, you know, um, uh, uh, Japan's full identity as a great power. So that's why I chose to fudge that in this particular lecture. Okay. Because I was trying to tease out the fact that it would, would Japan not be a great power because it doesn't have the military, I mean, capability. It does have extraordinary military capabilities. It used to have the second largest navy in the world at one point, but there is no political will to use that military. And Abe's attempt to change the constitution and to change the national will uh, failed. I think we can say fairly conclusively, there's obviously a strong nationalist force in Japanese politics, but it's not in the mainstream of, 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 of the Japanese political uh, arena. So anyway, um, second question. Um, clearly, if one's talking about China's resurgence, which you were, you have to do so in the context of America's perceived um, decline. Um, how would you analyze that decline? How would you describe it? Even if uh, perhaps you wouldn't even want to use the term decline. Um, and could you just say a quick word about how what's happened in Afghanistan? Not so much the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was always going to happen, but the manner of the withdrawal, uh, which brings to memory scenes of what happened in Saigon in 1975, which obviously had an impact on America's reputation in Asia, uh, how Afghanistan may have changed or not changed perceptions of American uh, decline, or at least the decline of American hegemony. The, let me try and sort of reflect what I, I, I think sort of, you, you know, regional sentiments are. It is a vast region, so there's obviously a range of, of, of views. But if we were to sort of converge on a sort of median point, um, the first thing to say is that I don't think that East Asia as a whole is a region that has the kind of infallible belief, right, in the enduring nature 
of US preponderance, right? The way we might find that belief in other parts of the world, right? Such as Australia, for example, the attitude and the, and the belief is very different, you know, on, on that score. So I don't, I think that most East Asian audiences don't start from that expectation of longevity of US hegemony, okay? So the response to something like Afghanistan is shaped by that background expectation. This is the region in which, you know, the US was defeated in Vietnam, right? Um, so I think there has been the expectation of the dilution of US leadership uh, for some time prior to the withdrawal, abrupt withdrawal from Afghanistan, right? And just before the abrupt withdrawal from Afghanistan, of course, was the massive blow having to deal with four years of Donald Trump, um, which led to, you know, a series of fairly significant mental adjustments, not just in US allies, but across the region. Um, and I think that that four year period was fairly critical in reshaping uh, expectations, rhetoric, and strategic planning frameworks in the region in a way which basically oriented regional countries into hoping for the best, but planning for the worst, right? Um, and I think that's literally how, mm. you know, many countries in the region put it, right? So a lot of faith, in other words, what I'm saying is a lot of faith was shaken under Trump already. And then we get Afghanistan, right? Um, and so the Afghanistan shock isn't as great as it would have been by itself if there weren't Trump in the four years pre prior to that. Right? So it's kind of cumulative in, in mm -hmm. that sense. And I think it's too early to tell um, whether the, 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 mm, the Afghanistan withdrawal is something that would have broken the camel's back in terms of faith in US commitment to the region, this could play both ways. And you see it in the discourse of the region, it plays both ways. On the one hand, oh dear, this is terrible. It signals, you know, US decline at a global level. On the other hand, actually this is a good thing because the US has been too bogged down in the Middle East for too long to be able to pay the attention it needed to pay to East Asia. Now that it's out of the Middle East, right? It's attention possibly is less divided. So you've got those two aspects going. In, in regional responses mm -hmm. to, to, to the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I think it's, it's a bit more uh, ambivalent, shall I put it, um, than, than maybe the responses elsewhere um, in the world. Right, and you're putting Afghanistan in, in, in its recent historical context there, because the, one of the reasons, of course, perhaps the main reason why the US withdrew so quickly was it wants to concentrate 100% on China, and that's obviously become the, the dominant strategic narrative in Washington. So this is my next question. This uh, new idea of, 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 of strategizing, which is a very uh, appealing idea, and certainly would appeal to Europeans because in part, I think the European Union has been following a similar pattern or would, would follow a similar pattern, but it's being asked to take sides now. And, and of course, that's deeply difficult for some Europeans who don't want to take sides on China or think it's too early to take sides they wish to get more data in to see where China's going. But that's not my question. My question is that the US has used its alliance system and is re trying to reinvigorate its alliance system, countries like South Korea and Japan. This must be a threat to this new way of understanding strategy, but another threat. One advantage is that China has always done partnerships, not alliances. and It's never done coalition warfare. These are points that Xi made when he addressed the United Nations in 2019. But in one of his most recent speeches, a couple of months ago, he said that wolf diplomacy has failed, basically, and it's now time to start making friends. So my question to you is, will China be trying to buy off uh, some countries uh, in, in East Asia as a kind of uh, an alliance uh, system? Not in the traditional Western sense of alliances, perhaps, but making people make choices, not being able to balance, having to take sides, the kind of thing that the United States expects its allies to do. Well, I suppose the, the <laughs> slight tangent here, but you know, your question seems to assume that the US doesn't buy people off. And of course, that's, that's what it does. No, it does buy well. people off. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Um, I, I, I think, yes, um, w w we do find an intensification, don't we, of, you know, the, the current Chinese means of selling, if you like, you know, uh, to the region, uh, that there, there are attractive aspects of what China offers, which have to date been quite different from what the United States has offered. Um, and I think that, you know, the Chinese see this, and I don't think that we would expect to see sort of an aping or an imitation of um, US means of doing alliances or winning friends in an obvious way, right? Um, I don't think we would expect to see that. But your question is actually a more subtle one. It's about to what extent are we going to see China basically making zero sum calls, right, mm. on its partners in the in, in the region? And of course, this is the thing that regional countries have been very worried about. Um, they're used to getting these this type of pressure occasionally from the Americans, right? But they've never been pushed up against the wall. Right. But if, if now what they get is the calls from both sides and pushed out, they will get pushed up against the wall when both sides decide to make these kinds of zero sum demands. Um, and again, I, I don't know because I don't have any insight into you know, what's happening in Zhongnan Hai. But, but the point, the, what, what I can see from the point of view of the rest of the East Asian states, which are trying to forestall this possibility, is some fairly interesting ways of skirting around this. I'll just give one example. Um, if you look at how Japan has navigated the Indo-Pacific um, conundrum, right? Um, this of course was a, a Japanese idea, right? The arc of prosperity and, and, and democracy and, and so on and so forth. Japan since about 2018, interestingly, right, has been pulling back from the rhetorical excesses of the Indo-Pacific rolling back on how that gets identified with human rights, democracy, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to reorientate some of the partnerships within the court into things like, you know, um, the partnership of quality in infrastructure, you know, providing alternatives for um, countries in China's periphery, alternatives to China's way of financing infrastructure, for example. Um, most importantly, it's done that in a way that has made clear to third party states that this is not a binary choice. You can take BRI funding and take you know, uh, PQI funding. It's a non-zero sum choice. It's how they've quite specifically spun this. I read that and a variety of other things as you know, a classic Japanese way of turning this and trying to steer it away from ways in which it could potentially develop in a situation, you know, where it would come under pressure from both the US and China to turn everything into a binary choice. So it's kind of preemptively recasting things so that they're not binary, precisely to try to avoid that situation. I'm not saying that is the only thing that, that's being done mm -hmm. or that it will succeed, but you can see that, you know, that there is, that within the confines of what these non great powers can do, um, there's some interesting ways to try and recast that contest. Mm -hmm. right? And recasting these contests, of course, is a traditional well, traditional way in which these non great powers have tried to shape the regional arena for great power competition. Right? That, that, that's quite an important element um, of how they've been trying to do it. If I have, can I give another example? If yes, I have absolutely. Time, or would you like to move on? No, 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 okay, give another example. It's, I bet yeah, this, this is a actually, very important point. This actually um, is something which I skipped over earlier. Um, and I can go back and just bring this up because I think it illustrates it very well. Um, so I alluded earlier to uh, Lee's analysis about South Korea and, and the way it's sort of, you know, the, the changing role of the US alliance in, in South Korean strategies. And in that same article, she makes a really interesting argument that, you know, under pressure, both from the United States and China, South Korea is in a position of having made a strategic non-decision, right, vis-a-vis -vis these two 
uh, points of pressure. And she, she relates it to what she calls split interests and split politics within Korea, right? And this obviously comes as a result of proximity to China, you know, the emphasis on un eventual unification with the North and economic considerations as well. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice analysis because you know, um, she's very explicit about it, that the non-decision is not, is not a de facto sort of decision because they can't make up their minds, right? But it is actually a strategic stance that we're just going to cleave to this. Yes, we are US ally, but that's not what the alliance is for, right? Yes, we're next to China. We're not going to cave into it, but we're not going to contain it either, right? Um, so, you know, there's a bit of a knuckling down, hunkering down, sorry, as well. Um, where you may not expect to see it. And I think South Korea is somewhere that, you know, you, you're not expecting to see that kind of hunkering down because aren't you already aligned, right? But here you have it, you know, strategic non-decision. Um, again, we'll see how this pans out, you know, in the years to come. Are you, I mean, this brings me to my next question. Um, are, you, are you concerned at all that uh, the American hegemony or what's left of it, if anything is left, will one day be replaced by Chinese hegemony. And the, the old uh, idea, this is a very European idea of international relations idea, what well, one hegemon replaces another. I mean, that's the law of, of history. Hegemony can take a very different form. And you mentioned tribute. And if you go back, to, if you're looking at Andrew Phillips's work on, uh, on, on, on international systems, to quote a, a well-known Australian scholar, uh, he says that the Chinese tribute system was hierarchical, it was non-legal, it was non-contractual. It wasn't even really hard power, it was largely soft power. It was largely economic in that China gave rather than took. Um, and he said that was the normative order uh, of, the, of the tribute system or what, what is those days, days I think we call a Sinocentric system, which lasted for about 700 years. But the currency of power, it seems to me, when I look at history, is respect. That was the one thing that was absolutely essential that one respected China's place uh, in the system or in the region. Which brings me to the question I want to ask, which is one that we, we ask over here. W what is your perception of, of China's respect for multilateralism as opposed to multipolarity? Because multipolarity is one in which, of course, the big nations are at the top and everybody knows their place within the system, but there is a place uh, and they have legal rights multilateralism is one in which um, there is no place in a system and it seems to me to be very much the ASEAN model uh, multilateralism. Is that ultimately compatible with a China that replaces the United States as the really dominant power in the region? If the US were to go back to Pearl Harbor, which of course is what China has often said is its stated aim that it leaves the Western Pacific and there are no American bases anywhere in East Asia, uh, on the mainland of East Asia, um, will there be any room for multilateralism or will it be a multipolar world of, of deals, some of which will be zero sum, many of which will be non-zero sum? It's the kind of question that Kishore Mababani raised, which got him into trouble in Singapore when he said you have to make choices and you have to be realistic about the fact that China will replace the United States uh, as the hegemonic power. As I say, he got into trouble for that. It's the basis of his um, recent book, Has China Won? Look, Christopher smuggled many different questions into Absolutely, that set of remarks. Because we only got a limited um, amount of time. Uh, yes, um, uh, some of which are, are quite complex and and um, uh, and require long answers. So, so let 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 me try to sort of focus on, on what I think the key thrust of your, your question is. Um, of course, a lot of work has been done on these issues. Um, and it, it, uh, I'll, I'll raise a couple of examples here. Um, first is that debate about, yes, we can all agree, I think, that we are seeing the erosion of US hegemony. Okay. Um, to me, that doesn't mean the U.S. withdraws from the region. It's just the erosion of U.S. hegemony. I think we all agree on that. Then the main question is what replaces that, right? And uh, a range of different answers to that. The most compelling options 
that I've seen on the in the literature um, are not again not the binary ones, but the ones that stress the, how the multiplicities that are going to replace the hegemony interact with each other, right? So, so the nature of the multiplicity, I think again, there's a fair amount of agreement that we're not going to see Chinese hegemony replace American hegemony, right? But we're going to have this rather fudged plural, plural is the right word, system uh, or order replacing US hegemony, which let me please remind everyone that US hegemony in East Asia, it was a short interregnum of about 20 years after the Cold War. That's it, all right? Uh, this is not a region that is, you know, that has had long standing, it's an interregnum. So the, for me, the most compelling analyses have suggested, for example, that you might have Amitabha Chaya's multiplex order, right? Which is analogous to a cinema complex with multiple cinemas and you can just go in depending on which show you want to watch, you know, and you have a variety of options. That's quite an optimistic liberal institutionalist kind of take on, on what might um, uh, eventuate. More recently, um, Brantley Womack, I know is writing up his book on this, you know, what he calls a multi-nodal uh, order, which I'm quite persuaded by. Um, this idea that because of complex interdependence and because of you know, the issue areas that we've got today. Uh, you're not going to have simple multipolarity. It's not about poles. It's, it's about how networks connect to each other and what, can, what become nodes in, in these assemblages of issues. I'm quite persuaded by that because I think it actually reflects the nature of major strategic issues today, right? Um, so, so that gives you a bit of a you know, a cross between a functionalist approach to, you know, pick the institution, build issue, but also a sense of reality about how issues are not segregatable easily from each other. So I like that, that model. Um, when, when I've had to teach, when I teach on this, and my students who are in this will, will know, I use a pair of slides. And the first slide I show is this remarkable feat of architecture, which is a house on a, on a cliff that has only got one pillar. So that's the order we're transitioning out of. And the one we're transitioning to is the traditional tropical house that has multiple stilts, right? And that great airy space underneath it. And that, that's what I think we're getting to. That's neither multipolar nor multilateral, it's both, right? Um, and so it's the, it's the plural, plurality of what we're going to, I think, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that will eventuate. Then the rest, really depends on how, you know, either singular powers or groups of power are able to coalesce and join up key strategic issues across the economic and, and military realms, right, um, et cetera, et cetera. On the issue of Chinese hegemony, I'll just say one quick thing. Um, and I've got a piece in Global Asia in 2019. Um, it's quite a short piece, so very quickly readable you know, that makes this argument in, in more detail. You know, China has very little to gain by aiming to take over the American role in the region, right? All the plethora of regional problems, hotspots, conflict zones, etc., immediately become China's problems if the US withdraws or if the US is persuaded or is kicked out of the region. Um, I think most Chinese policymakers are actually quite well aware of this, which is um, why they have for a long time resisted taking on great power responsibilities, particularly in this region. Right? Um, so I don't think there's any sort of easy thinking on the part of the Chinese as well about we'll boot the Americans out, we'll just simply take over. Um, and, and, and that by itself, that factor alone, I think, you know, um, will push the region towards some kind of a plural order if we should see further erosion of US hegemony in the region. That's, that's very persuasive. And I think your analysis is very compelling. But my concern is that very few American policymakers yeah. will, yeah, will, will, will see this in, in this way. And it'll be some time perhaps for a new generation of policymakers to get to that, to get to that stage. Mm. Um, we're 
running out of time for me, and I know there are a lot of questions. Um, so can I just raise one very last point, and then I'll turn over to Hugh, uh, which is to play the role of devil's advocate and the kind of European skeptic here. Um, is this all going to have time to work? It seems to me with Taiwan, we are now, the clock is, is ticking. You know, back in 2002, when I, I used to come to Singapore and give talks, I, I said, look, China will take over the South China Seas. And people said, that's all nonsense. And back in 2014, I said in Bangkok, I was writing a book on the coming war between the United States and China. How can you possibly say that now there's a conference every other week on the coming war between the United States, or the possibility anyway. Now that you can say and dismiss this as this is a typical Western understanding on my part of balance of power, uh, cynicism uh, going back to 1914, because we had an e economic security nexus in Europe in 1914. Oh, we had very good arguments and chairman of the Bank of England saying the bond markets would collapse within three months of a war between Germany and, and the United Kingdom. Uh, and we got war because wars happen by accident, uh, not by design. Uh, and they happen because people blunder into them. And it seems to me, I mean, we may have a war between the United States and China in 30 years time about lunar bases. But over the next 20 years, mm. the next 10, actually, Taiwan is the critical issue. So could you just mm. say something very brief, Evelyn, about that issue of Taiwan? And then I'll turn over to Hugh. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, Christopher. And, and your book is still one of my favorite treatments of, of right. you know, um, mm. of, of, of a potential conflict between the US and China. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that you know, accidental wars and slippery slope wars um, remain you know, um, constant uh, dangers uh, for the region. And, and I think one of the reasons why you see so much insistent rhetoric in the region, right, about alternative ways of thinking strategically, about trying to you know, push great power conflict into less zero sum arenas is precisely because of the awareness Mm -hmm. You know, that A, these things can happen precisely for the kinds of reasons that you pointed out. And B, if they do happen, they are actually not, they would actually wouldn't happen within the control of East Asian states themselves, right? You know that old saying about the Taiwan conflict, you know, that, you know, whether it starts or not, maybe up to Taiwan, but whether it's a big fight or a small fight depends on China. Whether mm -hmm. it's a real fight will depend on the United States. Right. And that mm -hmm. I think encapsulates it very well. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so I, I don't, you know, at all underestimate um, the current dangers of, you know, miscalculations, missteps, misinformation, slippery slopes mm -hmm. at all, especially in the Taiwan theater. Okay, well, on that um, sobering note, um, Hugh, can you take over? I know there are quite a lot of questions and thank you again on my on my part Evelyn for, for doing exactly what we wanted you to do which is how we should be thinking about strategy in the 21st century and not still applying 19th century principles which we've all been doing <laughs> practically up to now thanks again Hugh over to thank, you and thanks for your your questions thank you well, good well <clears throat> let's uh, take straight off from that last point with a question from Rosemary Foote. Oh, I think it's gonna be an exam question. Hi, um, Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she notes that uh, she would argue that the US itself is engaged in expanding its alignments, internal balancing, trying to find points of collaboration, exactly as you described East Asian powers. Uh, her point though is, will the US find this adjustment to the multidimensionality of China's rise more difficult to do than Asian states find it yes um of course as always rosemary is right um yes i i agree rosemary um and, and this has always been i think the greatest concern of all as, as you know in, in the region that you know that for all the efforts that east asian states have made to socialize great powers um in the last 20 to 30 years the you know the, the the one that they've always been most worried about is the united states that they wouldn't be socialized into the idea of having to somehow share the stage with china quickly enough right to to avoid the situation of a declining hegemon essentially 
you know, triggering a conflict because time isn't on its side. Um, so yes, I, I share your worry with me. Good, I'm gonna ask about four more questions or five more. So please feel free to give very terse answers. Um, on the Indo-Pacific, we have a couple of questions from uh, Druba Padial and Joe also. Um, briefly, how can non-great powers respond to the Indo-Pacific strategies of the US and the European powers? And how do you see the European powers adding to the mix in terms of uh, projecting their own Indo-Pacific strategies? Um, yes. So the, I, I guess the, the short and pithy answer to this is, I have a whole lecture on this, I can send you the link. Uh, the the Indo-Pacific um, is one of three competing visions in the region. There is a danger, of course, today that we think the Indo-Pacific is it, you know, um, but please don't forget that, you know, the Asia-Pacific is the actual fleshed out uh, strategic uh, uh, region. Uh, that's the incumbent in some ways, and the Indo-Pacific is, is the upstart challenger to that. Uh, there is, of course, you know, the Chinese vision of Greater Asia across the continent as well. So, so I see a more dynamic um, competition amongst those three um, um, uh, regional imaginaries, if you want to put it that way. Um, and the classic way of non-great powers in East Asia responding to that bevy of choices um, is, is to encourage a bevy of choices so that there's diversification. Um, I think that that's a quick answer to that. Um, I, I, and again, the Europeans adding to this mix is the Europeans adding to this mix. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a thoroughfare region. You know, um, any power that feels that it has a stake in the region um, uh, would in this kind of fluid situation be expected uh, to weigh in if they had the means to do so. And I think we're seeing that, you know, coming to pass. Of course, we will have to see what this amounts to um, in, in the period to come. A lot of these initiatives are rhetorical at the moment. Some of them are very, very incipient. And many of them are rather contradictory. France wants to be an Indo-Pacific power, uh, but has been cut out by the United States and, and Australia in, 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 in the latest AUKUS deal, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, it's getting interesting, let's put it that way. A couple of questions now about ASEAN from Muhammad Iqbal Hafizan in Indonesia and Vishal K. Um, what's your assessment of the increasingly transactional foreign policy of ASEAN post-COVID? And a more longer term question, does the changing dynamics inside ASEAN reference, particularly Cambodia and Laos vis-a-vis -vis China, in some sense undermine ASEAN? Yeah, I mean, as I said, you know, it, it, one of the difficulties is that increased contestation, right? And and um, and the ASEAN arena is one in which we, we see, there's always been contestation. I mean, it's difficult to get consensus amongst 10 very, very different states. Um, and of course, it is fashionable to argue that, you know, China is trying to peel apart uh, parts of mainland, um, smaller, poorer Southeast Asian countries um, from, from the other parts of, of the subregion, and you know, I, I'd only say this, right? Every country in Southeast Asia that has options will hedge. Every Southeast Asian country wants to hedge. The variable is whether they can find another external power with whom to hedge. Right? This is the classic Cambodian, you know, explanation always. Right? We don't want to take all our investment from China, but no one else wants to invest in us. How about you invest in us? then we'll have some options, okay? Um, so so that, that's, that's the thing about the uh, dynamics of ASEAN part. Um, transactionalism post-COVID, I think is too early to tell. Uh, we're not yet post-COVID, mm. so, so mm. Let, let's, let's see how, how this moves along. Fair enough. Let's jump back to Europe for a second. So Robert Cooper asks or says, order not power is quite a good description of the EU under the US umbrella. What can Europe learn from Asia? You know, Barry and I, in, in our latest book, told Asia not to learn from Europe. Um, and I'm going to flip that and tell Europe maybe, you know, don't, don't try to learn from Asia, but, but learn your own lessons fairly quickly because you've got your own very serious problems, right? Uh, um, not least that unresolved issue of what to do about rising, you know, um, uh, Russian power and influence right, right on your doorstep and within 
your, your 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 boundaries as well. Um, and, and and I I think yes, order not power is generically uh, a useful reminder for everybody. But the way order will be thought about in the European context, um, you know, in terms of the agency that European countries have individually or collectively. Um, the parameters within which you could you could shape your regional order, your intersection of regional with international order are quite different from East Asia's. So, you know, you, I think a good point would be to start to think about the order question in a more focused way, um, but to think about how power in your case intersects with the shaping and reshaping of order. And only you have answers to that. Um, I don't think that East Asia would be able to provide you with any answers to that. Um, we have two questions about Vietnam from Mohammed uh, Yusuf and from uh, Phuong Tao and Guyan at LSE. Uh, one is, how does Vietnam deal with its dual need for economic and maritime security? And the second one is, will Vietnam seek a close relationship with the US to deal with, um, the, uh, with uh, naval exercises by by uh, China or the naval um, developments by China in the uh, South China Sea. Mm. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for the question, uh, for this question on what I think is one of the most important uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, uh, you know, Vietnam, of course, is important uh, in Southeast Asia because it is the one country with the longest and most successful record of dealing with a powerful China. Right, um, and I think that it it balances between its economic dependencies and its, you know, um, military tensions and conflicts with China uh, in a very instructive way, um, and and it's uh, you know that there's a there's a range of examples we could think of from the Vietnamese. Um, uh, country case ranging from things like it's very sophisticated diplomacy which runs on parallel tracks always with an eye on both the Chinese side and the American side it's a very carefully calibrated kind of di diplomacy but also in the sense in the way in which it is actually quite comprehensive in its strategic outlook so for example I've just finished a, a, a study that looks at the importance of Chinese investment in Vietnam and you wouldn't be surprised to hear that of all the Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam is actually, you know, in, in, since about 2012, right, the country that has diversified most away from Chinese investment. So uniquely alone amongst the Southeast Asian countries, um, Vietnam doesn't have uh, a, a, a significant portfolio of very large or large Chinese investments in its territory. It is alone among Southeast Asian countries for that. Um, and it also has a much more diversified uh, set of uh, foreign investors than most other Southeast Asian countries. Um, so again, that preemptive, you know, um, sharp-eyed avoidance of over-dependence on China is very clear there. Um, on this question of U.S. alignment, um, um, I was fortunate enough to do with Bates Gill and others a project on looking at various Southeast Asian countries' prospects of negotiating tighter uh, security partnerships with the United States some years ago. And the report came out, I think, in 2017. Um, and, you know, I think our findings still stand. There is no prospect of Vietnam uh, contracting an alliance with the United States. Uh, that's quite clear. Um, they're too close to China to be able to do that. It is too provocative. They have moved towards um, some radical um, readjustments of their strategic partnership with the United States in recent years. And that that is a very clear indicator of uh, Vietnam leveraging the US as the offshore deterrent to potential Chinese aggression. But it's not the only thing that Vietnam is doing. This, this part is really important. It's not yeah. just building the security partnership with the US as its only um, strategic approach. It's doing all these other things with China and within the region as well. Right. Good. We have a question now from ANU itself, from uh, Juan Ni Li, which is, what are Australia's options in, and they use the word balancing, between the US and China? <laughs> 
how long's a piece of string? Um, I, <laughs> you know, I well, in the abstract, uh, there are very many options indeed, right? Um, the the sky is the limit. The the vision of your strategies is the limit. In practice, I think we have bumped up against those limits um, uh, very quickly, uh, and particularly in recent um, uh, developments. Australia, of course, of course, you know, is not it's not part of the, country, the group of countries that I've looked at today, uh, but it does stand apart in the region uh, quite uniquely as having a very particular um, ideology and mindset when it comes to its place in the world, its place vis-a-vis -vis the United States, right? Um, and, and that poses for Australia, it's certainly under the current leadership, um, a set of fairly tight constraints about what it sees as its viable options um, in what they call standing up to China. In, in the um, mm. current system. So we've bumped up against those, those limits of options fairly quickly as a result, um, which, you know, uh, which they're free to do, of course. Yeah. And a related question from uh, Fan Trong is, how does, how does AUKUS affect ASEAN? What's the knock-on effect in the region of the AUKUS deal? Um, yeah, I think AUKUS has an effect, of course, not just on ASEAN. <laughs> it, it, it has an effect on, on the region as as a whole um, you know you would expect as you would expect in a very varied region there's been a variety of responses right uh, to uh, to AUKUS but I think there's some clear parameters and a very clear duality to those responses and so the agreement is that AUKUS is an example of choosing one side uh, of putting all one's eggs in one basket right in this uh u.s china rivalry so everyone agrees and everyone sees orcas that way um the duality is as follows right on the one hand there's a lot of recognition that there are dangers in this process right um uh, uh, choosing one side uh and in this particular way may trigger excessively antagonistic responses and therefore an insecurity spiral with china Okay, so, so there's that worry on the one hand. At the same time, and this is why it's a duality, at the same time, there are perceived advantages to the rest of East Asia that Australia, um, the UK and the US do this, right? Because if it can help to bolster continued US forward presence and commitment in the region as a deterrent to China's excesses, that's not a bad thing necessarily, especially if it buys room to help the rest of the East Asian countries to forestall having to more obviously choose the US side or to more obviously, you know, move from their positions of strategic non-decision. Okay. Um, so there's a potential for free riding, in other words. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, but those two um, views are there at the same time. Okay, thanks. Well, that brings us to the final whistle. Um, it remains, sorry about questions we couldn't answer, but you did a fantastic job in racing through at least some of the ones we had. Um, on behalf of LSE Ideas, uh, Professor Christopher Coker, and the 130 people who listened online to your lecture, I want to say thank you very much indeed for a really brilliant exposition of strategic choices and how they're being elaborated in East Asia. Uh, it was a, a, an incredible session. We're very grateful to you. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh, Thank you, Christopher, and, and everyone for your engagement. Thank you. I'd love to have the questions if, if that's possible. Thank you.